Welcome to the Photo Ethics Podcast. I'm your host, Savannah Dodd, and I'm the founder of the Photography Ethics Center. Each week, I'll be talking with an accomplished photographer about the ethics of their practice. Today, in episode number two, we'll be talking with Martha Tedesse on unlearning and learning ethics. Martha Tedesse is a freelance humanitarian photographer and photojournalist who uses her passion to tell stories of social justice and representative images of Ethiopia and the continent of Africa at large. She began honing her craft in 2011. Currently, she consults with a variety of local and international NGOs, in addition to building her personal portfolio by traveling to different parts of the world. Martha is a recipient of the East African Photography Award in 2019, organized by Uganda Press Photo. I was wondering if we could start by maybe, um, if you could talk a little bit about your work, what kind of work you do. Um, okay. Uh, well, I do humanitarian work in Ethiopia. I travel around different regions to document development projects for different local and international organizations. And how did you first get into that? Uh, well, I studied um, developmental studies, and I've always been interested in the community development, um, but also I have had interest in storytelling, meeting new people, traveling. So I would say uh, my degree definitely has played its role on how I how it has shaped me to get into humanitarian work, um, humanitarian photography. But yeah, I tried to kind of put the two together, development and art, and well, humanitarian photography was birthed, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Absolutely. As well, my, my background is actually in the anthropology of development. So I sort of come from a somewhat similar uh, academic background. And I, I totally can identify with what you're saying about bringing the two together. How long have you been doing humanitarian photography? And how did you or what do you wish that you knew when you first started? I started in 2016. Um, I started out I started sharing my photographs on Instagram and uh, potential clients were reaching out and there aren't really schools there. Actually, there are no schools uh, in Addis that work for both storytelling and photography. It's either technical, um, the technical aspect of it, um, basics of photography. So... I am a self-taught. I learned uh, through internet and YouTube videos as many Ethiopians. Um, What I wish I had known, I think, uh, within my work, I wish I had known more about um, consent, balanced narrative, ethics. um, These things you learn the hard way, uh, meaning you make mistakes because... You know, at this digital time, photographs are everywhere and you think just because you have a camera, you could go around, um, take pictures of people, try to get stories. Um, So, which I have done as as I started out and I learned a lot since then. Um, But yeah, I wish I had known about these things early on. Absolutely. That's really, it's really hard to to learn that, I think, on, on the hoof. But it's also something that's, I guess, hard to to learn about in advance as well. As well. It can be kind of a, a bit of a catch-22. Do you have any sort of example or any moment in your experience when that was sort of um, a moment that you realized, this doesn't feel right, or I would like to change how I practice? Is there any one moment that sort of impacted you or any example of a situation that you found yourself in? Mm, yeah, I mean, I learned... I. Le- I really admire Chimamanda's The Danger of a Single Story um, that's available on YouTube. I learned a lot about poverty porn, um, white gays uh, through the internet Um, and how I came across, I mean, as you work, as you already know, the humanitarian world is, um, can be tough and the image that has been taken, uh, especially within Africa has been misrepresented, been unethical. 
So through those inmates, I had to unlearn so many um, biases, could be bias or um, even angles, you know, you learn because, like I said, there aren't really schools in Addis. So you learn from what you get in the Internet and you have thousands of answers. You get to decide which one works, right? So even those, the type of photographs, the type of storytelling that I've learned, I had to unlearn as I go. And um, yeah, um, people like Jumamanda um, and other photographers that I follow online has contributed a lot to where I am now. But yeah, still figuring it out. I wouldn't say I have figured everything out. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely love Chimamanda's The Danger of a Single Story. I, I share that in a lot of the workshops that I run. I think it's a really, um, a really powerful, powerful lecture and a really powerful way of way of talking about representation. And we'll be sure to definitely link to that in the yeah, show notes for this great. podcast. Yeah. yeah. I love that you're talking about sort of unlearning how we represent um places, but particularly different countries within Africa. How, what does that process look like for you? Or how do you, how do you confront maybe some of the ways that we expect representations to be? And how do you challenge that in your own work? Um, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, and learning is difficult, right? Uh, because you, there's so much pride in whatever you have consumed in the past. So, um, even within my work, like I said, when I started out, um, just being general, it, I would take a picture of a specific area and then would write my caption as Ethiopia or even Africa. But, um, <laughs> that, that kind of representations I had to remove because that really doesn't represent the whole majority. Um, the same way as we speak, I used to say, oh, the photography scene in Ethiopia, but really I am from Addis, the capital city, and I think I can only speak the experience of photographers in Addis. Um, so the growth or the rise of photography in Ethiopia cannot be my, my experience. I can't speak for other regions. So I think that's the kind of, I don't know if that makes sense, but this is to say within our story, within the stories that I tell, I try to make it city-based or area-based just to make sure um, people are represented on their own as individuals. So yeah, and learning from different articles on representation, inclusion, diversity, these conversations are still happening online and that's so relevant for my work as well and um, people from different ethnic groups economic status I have to ask myself if I am representing people from different religious groups minorities and um, yeah having these kind of reflections helps me to confront myself and also challenge the audience that I bring these stories to I think that's so wonderfully put. Absolutely. It seems like a lot of times in the representations that we get um, from the very vast continent of Africa, it seems like there's a flattening of experience that happens a lot and a flattening of, of the types of stories that we see, right? And um, a limitation. It all sort of becomes very homogenized, I think, in our in our visual world. So I, I love that that photographers like yourself are, are representing stories with so much nuance and so much depth uh, and and diversity of, of experiences. I think that's really, really brilliant. How, how do you find negotiating with your the clients that you work for? Because I think that this is um, this can be a little bit of a, a point of tension in some of the the conversations I've had with others about one, you know, how much time we're given. You know, we're not we're not given the time to necessarily do consent in a certain way or do, you know, the things, the steps that we need to do to tell a story ethically or to tell a story with a lot of nuance and depth. Um, but also, I guess, in terms of how then 
you know, these organizations go off and use your photographs and how they choose to caption it and how, have you had any sort of, any barriers with that or any dilemmas with that? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so with, with my work, um, I would be given the people I will be photograph. I will be interviewing or photographing. I would have a guideline. This is the community you're going to. This is the people you'll be photographing. And uh, with my longer contracts, it's very smooth to kind of have your own voice. And that has been helpful to challenge the communications team to say, to have my own voice in that. But for my short term um, assignment, say a random client reaching out through my website, hey, uh, we have an organization where you are, three days um, work, and then they'll just send you guidelines and it doesn't ask for captions sometimes. And you're like, wait, so I go to the community, take pictures and come back and I don't know where these photographs are going to be um, taken, how they're going to be used. So I would mention, well, my my daily rate actually includes this, this, this. So I would love to get their stories. You know, who are they? What are their names? What do they want to tell us? And their uh, constant release forms as well. Most of the times, um, NGOs don't have consent release forms for the people that they support. Um, I find it very problematic because there is that assumption or entitlement that their clients would be okay to be photographed just because they provide financial support to the group, to the community. And I always um, try to challenge the the clients that I meet uh, with, you know, the first no is no for me. If your clients are not willing to be photographed, they have their rights. Just because, you know, we contribute doesn't mean we can um, get their stories. So this kind of dilemmas happen. And I would say I am privileged to cancel um, or reject assignments in different times um and that's the privilege of being a freelance uh, yeah that's I don't know if this answers your question absolutely it does I think that's really I think it's such a delicate balance right because obviously they hold the power in the situation right like they're the ones um with the power of the purse so to speak it sounds very useful, I think, for for other photographers, I'm sure, to hear about how you challenge that by saying, actually, I already do this in my work. This is what I'm already including in the rate that I've given you. And so I will, you know, suggest that you also collect this information. Um, I think that's a really, really smart way of going about approaching that, because I think it can be a very difficult conversation to have when we feel mm-hmm. like, yeah. you know, they might not yeah, be be dealing with the photographs or presenting them in the same way that you would want them presented. Yeah, you would see, and to add on, you would see clients asking, what type of cameras do you have? Which professional camera are you using? You're like, but you know, that doesn't matter. <laughs> At this point, we're talking about humanitarian photography. There, there needs to be a question of stories. Where are your stories? Where are your previous work? Because the rest of the things come next, honestly. Absolutely. And what are your ethics, not what is your camera? (laughs) Yep, yep, exactly. That's really, really interesting. And in terms of consent forms, you said that you actually a lot of times find that you're providing your own consent form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Most of them don't have consent forms and they just say, hey, we have a supervisor, you're flying in this, this time, and then you'll photograph. So... Um, I would prepare, there is there is even a, an, um, a time where I had to prepare a consent form in different language because I speak uh, only one of the languages, so different regions have different language. So we have to make sure we prepare on their own language as well. It's not, it's not just because it's an international NGO doesn't mean the consent form should be in English. Have a local translate the consent form, let them know where that photograph is going and how it's going to be used. And it has to be read in a way they understand. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I, I think it's 
the core point of consent, right, is is understanding. It's not consent if people don't understand what they're actually consenting to. And I guess in terms of, so did you develop that consent form yourself or how did you go about developing a consent form for anybody else out there who maybe needs to do that for themselves? What would you mm-hmm. recommend? Um, like I said, I, I have also been part of the problem as starting out. And um, after getting to an NGO that actually has a consent form, I was like, wait a minute, there's actually this thing (laughs) where they actually put on paper. So from that, I um, developed consent forms. And there are online, I'm sure we can find samples where people can actually develop their own consent forms in their own terms. Yeah, that'll be something absolutely we can look into. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, to include in the show notes or even maybe to to draft something that could be quite useful for people afterwards. Yeah, yeah definitely. That would be great. And that's um, universal, right? You just say, do you want to be photographed or not? This photo is going to go this, this, this. And you just do, you just put that in different language. I don't think that there's any complication to how we collect consents. When you're implementing your own consent form, who holds on to that consent form? Do you hang on to that or do you pass that on to the mm-hmm. organization that you're working with? Um, the Well, the commission work, people, uh, the client holds the consent forms. Okay. It, even yeah. when you're producing the consent form yourself, it, you still pass that on to the client to hold on yep. to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's great actually as well, because I think it probably might be a reminder that uh, to them, oh, um, maybe all of our photographers should be doing this. Um, so you're <laughs> yeah. definitely setting a very, very good and very important example, I'm sure, mm-hmm. for the industry. So obviously, consent has been quite a hot button issue in the photojournalism and photography community online in the recent weeks. And I guess I was wondering, I've seen you, you know, comment on a few things on Twitter and just weigh into a few conversations. And that's why I really wanted to reach out to you because I feel like you're you're someone who's really taking a a role in in leading by example among photographers. And I was just wondering if you could maybe share your thoughts about some of the conversations that have been unfolding or if you have anything that you would like to contribute to that conversation. Mm, yeah, I mean, the current conversation revolves around um, diversity and inclusion. Um, the Black Lives Matter has really um, set a great narrative for social media, but also offline in our offices and everywhere. Um, and it has been, it really has been an interesting time um, to have these discussions online. I have met great photographers from around the world through Twitter and we have seen um, different online database that is open for um, uh, black uh, uh, photographers uh, and uh, minorities. It was very inspiring to see everyone coming together. I mean, my 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 <laughs> my frustration still is what has changed when it comes to agencies, what has changed when it comes to editors, because like minded people would get together, rant, rage, love on another and support. But the question remains, has there been a change within the agencies, the photography agencies, within the editors? Have that changed um, has this conversation really challenged um, the field. And I think that's the most important question that hasn't been answered or I haven't found the answer to because it's the same white male juries for photography competition. And you look at um, newsletter covers or magazine covers, it's still um, white male photographers taking over and um, African stories being awarded by white photographers. So these things are still happening. And I wonder how editors have shifted. I wish there were more editors speaking out on these conversations because it's just a field of like-minded people. Photographers are raging. We're sharing conversations. We're challenging one another. But I wish um, agencies took the center and also the editors to say, hey, we've been you know, failing in this, 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 but we're changing. But none of that is happening, and that's quite frustrating. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, the fight continues. I think we continue <laughs> to rage and try to challenge the field. Absolutely. I think that that is such an important point because I think we can sort of see what we already are thinking or feeling reflected back to us on social media, you know, especially if we're part of these communities that that believe in diversity and storytelling and that believe that that other voices need to be uplifted, not just the white male photographers that have been dominating the space for for such a long time. But at the same time, we might see that so much on social media. But if we're not seeing tangible change, I think, you, you know, I think that's such an important point. Mm-hmm. What can white photographers do to support positive change? Um, honestly, acknowledging the privilege is one and the first step. Um, because there is a huge backlash towards um, these uh, these uh, conversations, senior white photographers, um, quote unquote, award winning photographers are so fragile with this conversation saying, oh, we've been setting, you know, we've been there, we have contributed a lot. Nobody's talking about an individual. We're talking about system that has failed and benefited the white photographers undeniably, white male photographers specifically. So I think acknowledge that privilege. And um, honestly, if I have to be honest, leave the table when you shouldn't be speaking about, especially when it comes to inclusion and diversity, I would see (laughs) five white male photographers talking about inclusion and diversity. And they are part of an agency that has all, an all white ambassadors ambassador f- for photo- for their agency and you're like wait is this tapping on each other's shoulders what's happening here who's challenging who you know so yeah leave the table just give um give the chance for not give the chance give the deserving space for black photographers and african photographers local photographers And for editors, they would say, oh, there's limited time. We didn't know where to find. No, there are amazing data, amazing photographers in one one place. There are Women Photograph, Authority Collective, um, Diversity Photo. These platforms are created for um, black photographers. And I would... I would say editors honestly don't look. They just don't search because it's a, an easy way out to pick what's already around you. So yeah, these are my um, my recommendations. Just act on it. It's not a performative activism, but really showing support by taking action, saying no when it's not your space, and um, and calling out other colleagues and friends as well you know it's the same as uh, men calling out uh, rapists in the feminist discourse right I'm just trying to say you don't you hardly see white photographers calling out white photographers for unethical imagery or uh, problematic narrative so this needs to happen that makes a lot of sense. And I really appreciate your sharing those, uh, those thoughts. I think that those are really, I think that's just something that I think everybody needs to be constantly reminded of right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. I, I appreciate your, your sort of enumerating that. I think that that was very, will be very useful for people. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Yeah. What advice would you give to someone wanting to pursue a career that's similar to yours? Mm hmm. I mean, uh, dare, dare to share your work, even with your friends. I think when we start out, that's the first thing we hold on to. We are scared of sharing our work to the public, but also start just with friends. Know what's important. Uh, what else? Keep documenting. I think we all make mistakes and don't worry about making mistakes. Um, most importantly, have your own voice. That's the way you photograph, the way you tell your story. Have your own voice and uh, we don't have to imitate what others are doing. We learn from them and have your own, yeah. 
it's it's still important that we have our own voices, the way we tell stories. And within humanitarian work, I mean, it's a lot of development issues that could be covered, right? So being apologetic and human right work, humanitarian work, I believe is in the foundation of human rights. So um, have empathy towards all human beings. That's my comment. I, I really agree with you personally. I think that empathy is not something to be overlooked and to mm-hmm. shy away from. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I definitely yeah. agree with you. You're right. Not in a way you want to make that person look sad just because it's a humanitarian work. More so, you j- more on um, how you just share, you just stand in solidarity of their so their situation, basically, right? Absolutely. No, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I think that that's a great way to describe to describe empathy. Actually, I, I think that's very useful. Mm-hmm. And you talked a lot as well, and I really appreciated that you talked about, you know, how your practice hasn't always been what it is now. You know, looking mm-hmm. back, there Definitely. are probably things that you would do differently. And I think I really value it when people are vulnerable about that. And I really value you um, saying that as well, because I think it can be very difficult to look back. I know what I did 10 years ago, taking photographs of people, I dread to think, you know, I I just, I I would not do a lot of what I did previously now. And I think that that's growth. I think that that's that's Mm -hmm. normal and healthy and good, you know, but I do think it's a scary thing sometimes to approach. Do Mm -hmm. you have any advice about how to, because you've obviously made that transition in yourself. You've identified things and you've done that work of recognizing this didn't feel good. That didn't feel right. I wish Mm -hmm. I hadn't done that. How do you Mm -hmm. work through that and turn that into something positive? It's a process, honestly, because I can give you, I can give you some of uh, my photography work that I was like, what was I thinking? You know? Um, so when I started out, like I said, I wasn't well aware of consent, ethical and major image documentation. And I traveled to the south in Ethiopia and Omo Valley, which is, you know, every white photographer who has traveled to Ethiopia has definitely been um, to the Omo Valley, especially commercial photographers who are selling their work um, on their sites. And most of them. Okay, I will, I will correct myself here. <laughs> um, but uh, so I have traveled to the same place. Uh, like I told you, I come from Addis uh, Ababa. So I'm new to the area. And I have taken pictures um, of different communities there. I did have some of them. I have taken names. And of course the location, but not all of them. And until this day, I'm still figuring out how I'm going to do justice to those photographs. I, I share them on my Instagram when I, you know, when I get got back home. But then I started removing them from my Instagram, and uh, it was okay. This person has a name, let me just keep it. The photo has been engaged, people have engaged with it, you know, those all those dilemmas. But then it was just one time I was like, okay, I'm just gonna take every picture that I took from Omo Valley. This is not the way I have been currently telling stories and maybe someday I'll travel back and um, document their stories, get to know them more instead of just take picture, run away. And um, that has taught me a lot. And how I use it is by telling these stories. You know, I tell people I, I do delete my pictures from my website whenever I learn. Because, I mean, we, nobody's going to get it all figured out, right? So, yeah. And um, how I will use them, like I said, someday I would want to go back and document. And... Still today, whenever I travel, I would meet, I would have a very limited time, but there's a moment that I really want to capture. So there's always that dilemma of, okay, how do I take this picture? Why do I want to take this picture? You know, you have to constantly 
question yourself. So, yeah, I mean, this is this is my journey. I think that I really love what you said there about, I feel like something about what you said made it feel like the photographs that you took previously in that area are not going to waste because you've learned from it. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's something really valuable in that because I think that sometimes we think, oh, you know, I spent three weeks in wherever um, photographing and looking back on it, I wish I'd done it all differently. But that isn't a waste. That isn't a loss. You know, that was a learning experience as well. And that was also you learning um, how you want to tell stories in that area. And I think that if we can incorporate that even into part of the process, I think that that can really shift how we approach this conversation. Yeah, yeah. And mind you, here, I want to also say I am from Ethiopia. (laughs) We're talking about me going to another city, another town, another area. So this is how we should challenge ourselves and imagine when it is a white photographer traveling from the US, Europe or whatever to document a picture in Ethiopia. So we have to, just because I'm an Ethiopian doesn't give me access to people's stories. There should come a constant and I have to confront that with myself. Absolutely. And what kind of process do you apply when you are going into a community that's not your own? And what, I guess, advice would you give to those maybe foreign photographers from America or Europe who are traveling maybe to Ethiopia, maybe to Addis, but maybe to another place in terms of how they find that nuance and do a more ethical way of representing people's stories visually? Mm, I am yet to find a great photographer, a great foreign photographer that has done a great job when it comes to humanitarian photography. I haven't, because it's a, I'm, I, I, I'm not talking about their skills. I'm talking about storytelling. There definitely are wonderful and amazing white photographers around Africa documenting different stories. Um, But what type of narrative are they setting online? What type of stories are they sharing and how are they sharing it? Because I recently have shared how I have been in the same event to photograph Uh, to photograph a community and there was a photographer from the U.S., a white photographer who was there. And I have to be honest with you, the first thing I asked when that picture was published, that story was published, I questioned myself if we were at the same event. I'm not exaggerating and it has nothing to do with that person is my senior and I really respect the experience that that person has but I was so overwhelmed with the caption that was used to the same photographs that we have been shooting at the same event and not to say I did great I did excellent this is to say how as a local looking at that story that did not represent the community that we went to you know, so it is very important to ask the question of what type of storytelling am I using? What type of even the I mean, when it comes to post-production, we all know what type of photographs, uh, photographers, what type of editing they're being used, you know, maximum clarity. So it could look more <laughs> poverty strike city or town or village, whatever, you know. So all these things needs to be questioned, like why do I not use the same preset that I'm using when I'm documenting in a different community, you know? Why is my preset different? And why is my storytelling different? You don't see someone hashtag America on, um, let's say, um, I don't know, Black Lives Matter protest documentary somebody's working there was never hashtag america but you know one photographer would document an orphanage center somewhere in ethiopia and the hashtag would be africa and they're like wait a minute not to say these these are 
there's no wrong in those hashtags. I'm just trying to show how the generic narrative that's out there completely changes as the way we use pictures, you know? So, I mean, my advice, honestly, would be, why do you want to take that assignment? And where, how are you telling the stories? And who's telling the stories? And who are your reference points when you're trying to understand the community that you're trying to document? Because most of the times, uh, white photographers... It's kind of a circle. I don't know how to explain it on social media or Instagram. There is kind of, there is similar narrative, similar caption, similar. And you wonder if these people actually take notes or these photographers actually take notes from local photographers that are doing the work in that community, you know. And so, yeah, this, uh, this is an interesting discussion, but it will take all day, honestly. <laughs> Yeah. No, I, I think that that was very, very useful and very um, reflective, I guess, of, of some of the other conversations I've had with photographers through this podcast. But I think you also added a lot to that conversation, I, especially when you're talking about, you know, different presets that people are using, you know, and how how we edit photographs differently, depending on who we're who we're picturing or what or where we're, we're photographing. And I think that, you know, it seems to me that there's a type of aesthetic that we're holding this aesthetic up as being good, but we're not thinking about what those aesthetic decisions are saying, because all the, of those, you know, every time we yeah, use a high contrast or, you know, maximum clarity, like you were saying, that's conveying something very particular um, through the images. And I think we're not very good reflective sometimes of of what it's saying we're just saying oh that looks good or that looks like what I've seen or that looks you know that fits the hegemonic visual narrative of this subject um so I think that's a really useful point to bring up so thank you very much for that finally I'd like to ask you what does photography ethics mean to you it means everything I don't know (laughs) Um, yeah, I can, I can only ask the ethics behind before I actually enjoy a documentary photography, you know, um, it could be great, um, with, um, the technical, the composition, the lighting could be great, but how these photographs are documented, who documented them, why are important. And um, I think it's the genesis of documentation. Photography ethics is everything. We have to respect the people that we photograph, the things we want to tell about. Yeah, we have to we have to put the same effort we would put on how we want people to tell our stories. And that's, that's very important. I would want to be told and I would want my story to be told in a very balanced way, right? The bad, the good, the day, the night. So how, how am I sharing these or applying these and other people's stories? We interview people we get their interviews and that's how we tell the stories but do we ask them how and what they want to talk about or do we just carry our questions and these are the questions i want to ask you how do you want to answer them you know it has to be very informal for the people to feel comfortable to share their stories and it comes from them not from us Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Photo Ethics Podcast. The aim of this podcast is to share new insights about photography ethics with others. So if you heard something you liked, please share this podcast with someone who would appreciate it. The links to all things mentioned in this episode number two are available in the show notes at www.photoethics.org. Join me next week when we hear from Danielle Viasana about representation and equity.